Look at all this stuff. I would kill to have stuff like this. Please, go ahead and kill me. What are you talking about? Well, you, you think it's healthy to obsessively collect things? For whatever reason, I find the stoic, silver-haired anime girl archetype really neat. It might be because Ava is still my favorite series, or it might be something about the calm and control that this sort of stoicism can exude. But regardless, if there's one of these sorts of characters in a show, I'll probably give it a shot. And because Ava is kind of THE anime written about in academia, there's a lot of writings in this archetype. It can be variable how much I want to engage with scholarly anime writing, because, well, it can be like this. If the phallic mother is a woman with a penis, the hysterical phallic girl is a girl who is identified with the penis. The most telling example of this is Ayana Mirai. But I find Hiroki Azuma's work on the concept pretty useful. In Otaku, Japan's database animals, Azuma is writing in the early 2000s, looking back on the spate of these types of characters in the mid to late 90s. He cautions against understanding these figures as representing a linear influence from Rei Ayanami, stating, The emergence of Ayanami Rei did not influence many authors so much as changed the rules of the moe element sustaining otaku culture. As a result, even those authors who were not deliberately thinking of Ava unconsciously began to produce characters closely resembling Rei, using newly registered Moe elements. Asuma understands 90s otaku culture as sustained by the shuffling of what he calls the database, this growing and constantly shifting set of popular otaku Moe archetypes. And Asuma doesn't provide a name for this Rei type character, but he does define it, writing that they're characterized by a quiet personality, blue hair, white skin, and a mysterious power. He gives three main examples other than Rei. Hoshino Ruri from Martian successor Nadesco, Tsukishima Ruriko from Shizuku, and Otori Subame from Cyber Team in Akihabara. Ruriko from Shizuku is a little out of my wheelhouse as a character from an untranslated VN, but from what I've been able to look up about the plot, yeah, she's a stoic blue-haired girl with pale skin, and she's also a psychic manipulated by other characters. Definitely fits. Nadesco is an interesting one to read because Man, when I was getting into anime fandom as a young teen, that show was still pretty big in the fandom, but now it's just gone. Like, it used to be one of those series that sort of bridged the gap between mecha heads and non-mecha perverts, but now I only hear it brought up by people who play Super Robot Wars. And yeah, at the time, Ruri was kind of THE post-Ray Moe girl. Anyway, yada yada, I watched the whole thing prep for this video, Martin's success from Desco, let's get into it. It's significant, I think, that this show's title refers not to its central robot, but to the space battleship most of the series takes place on. You really get to know the Nadesco as a location. It feels lived in. From the communal dining area to the meditation room and the really well-designed bridge, you get a sense of these spaces as existing in relation to one another, rather than being just generic, isolated backgrounds. And in general, there's just a lot of, you know, chilling on the bridge in this show, which I'm always down for. In that sense, even though Nadesco is kind of this big homage and parody of various mecha series, this is a show that reminded me of Star Trek as much, if not more, than it did other anime. Particularly with its TNG-like episodic style, unlike, say, a Gundam show, which will usually be fairly serialized in its structure, a lot of the episodes here are basically little anthology-style one-offs. You've got a holodeck episode, an episode told out of sequence, a Yamato-style ship battle, a VR episode. As I understand it, the original Star Trek didn't make much of an impression in Japan, and it was really only in the 90s, after TNG, that you started to see the franchise's influence in anime. See also the many references to TNG in G Gundam. In terms of how Nadesco approaches this largely ship-based anthology-style format, it seems to fit pretty well into that post-TNG wave. Of course, if you're going to do one of these spaceship-style anthology shows, you need a very good cast. Unfortunately, I gotta say, pretty much all the male characters are really mid. I hate to say that, but I gotta call it like I see it, and these guys are just really lame. No drip and no charisma. Still, the emphasis here was definitely on cute bishoujo girls, so let's talk about that. Before we get to Ruri, I want to talk about the indisputable best character, Maki, who I had actually never heard of before watching this. And I just want to say to every anime fan writing about this series on message boards in the mid-2000s who somehow never mentioned this complete goat of a character, you have done me and the world a massive disservice. Okay, so, Maki. To start with, she's a goth, and she does that thing where hair obscures half her face. Maki 
Nothing. So already, good concept for a character, good framework. I am on board. But also, she speaks in a monotone and tells bad jokes, which she laughs at really obnoxiously. <laughs> How can it get any better than this? She basically spends the entire show doing bad puns. This is best girl. This is, they've perfected it. Why did we not get a hundred Mackie clones after this? Two, whenever Izumi Maki not on screen, all the other characters should be asking, where's Izumi Maki? But yes, the breakout star of the show was Ruri, which she actually wasn't designed to be. And you can tell that in the first half of the series where she's very peripheral. She's the mysterious operator of the ship's computer, who at first exists to occasionally make dry, cutting comments about the rest of the cast. Kondo desu. Kondo desu. Baka. Due to the massive fan appreciation, she was quickly given more and more to do in the series. And yeah, she has all the major traits Azuma identifies. Pale skin, well, silver hair, and mysterious power. She's got it all. Personality-wise, she's very sardonic and sarcastic, which provides a really nice counterpoint to the other characters, who are much more manic and unrestrained. She's very Fora Birch from Ghost World in vibe. I feel like Ruri's success is almost talked about in a dismissive way now. Like, oh, look at this show where the Moe girl overshadowed all the main characters. And the implication there is that there was something superficial about that appreciation. But honestly, no, Ruri is just the most compelling character in the series, and she probably has the most engaging arc. Like Rei Ayanami, she's being created by shadowy forces. In this case, she was basically brought up from birth in a lab to be the perfect operator for the ship's computer. As a result, she's understandably very emotionally stunted and not used to interacting with others in any kind of non-clinical environment. But because Nadesco is basically a light-hearted comedy, her arc moves towards self-actualization rather than tragedy, and there's a certain satisfaction in seeing this archetype experience a more linear development than, say, Rei did. You know, basically it's nice to see the sardonic shy girl make friends and be good at her job. My favorite episode is actually the one that delves into her origin, because up until this point, Nadesco has been a really screwball comedy, punctuated by, like, occasional torrents of mecha action, but here the pace really slows, the perspective becomes more interior, and we get to see how she views the world. Definitely like one of the least manic episodes. She also gives the last episode recaps, which honestly became one of my favorite parts of the series. They just have a lot of character. She always kind of summarizes what happens and then sort of very cuttingly and sarcastically kind of bitches about someone in the crew. But I particularly like the one after the episode I just described, where she's like, nope, not summarizing that too personal. That's really good stuff. At the same time, I'm not sure I can say that I love Nadesco in any sort of uncomplicated way. For me, it kind of exists at this awkward midpoint in anime culture, where shows are emphasizing bishoujo style characters, but they still feel the need to center fairly bland male protagonists. And yeah, like I previously said, the dudes in this, they're just mid. Even in the animation, it seems like the staff are way more excited about the periphery girl characters. That might be why I ended up disliking protagonist Akito so much, in a way I very rarely do. I mean, I tend to really like mecha protagonists. It's not that he's terrible, I guess. He's just a fairly generic blank slate, but because he's the focus, the whole cast has to kind of rotate around him, even though he's clearly not what the staff is passionate about. Also, it's got that annoying harem motif where everyone wants to bang him, and it's like, come on, this, this dude is nothing. He has no drip. What's going on here? It's kind of not surprising, given all that, that they made Ruri the main character of the follow-up movie, Prince of Darkness. And this film has a pretty bad reputation among the fans. I was kind of bracing myself for it to be terrible. Um, all I heard about it was that it was needlessly confusing and kind of committed character assassination. It was well received in Japan though, even receiving a Saiyan award. And I'll be honest, I really dug it. I liked it more than the show. I definitely get the criticisms, it's a massive tonal leap from the series, and also takes place after a big time jump, the events of which aren't really fully explained. And it's also a sequel to a video game with very important plot information that most of us will never play. So yeah, don't get me wrong, as an English language viewer, there's just going to be a certain level of frustration built into this thing. But I'll be honest, I found this movie really engaging and just really solid. Part of that is that the animation here by Production IG is so good. The whole art direction, really, it's amazing. It's got that particular late 90s Y2K space opera look. This kind of, hey, here's a standard sci-fi style world, but the internet is coming into being, and now we have to imagine what that's gonna look like in a future setting. 
So there's just this visual overload, holographic displays everywhere, and these massively overly complex computer interfaces. The way I'd describe it, it's like these characters are sort of inhabiting a web 2.0 space physically. I love it. It actually kind of reminded me of the hosted a Digimon movie at times. And yeah, it's pretty confusing, which I think is by design. I sort of read the first half hour as a big pastiche of Char's counterattack. You know, there's been a big time jump, bunch of new political stuff is happening, you can't really get a grasp on. Previously good guys now seem to be bad guys, and there's a whole lot of explosions. Honestly, I feel like this sort of information overload is almost a motif in mecha movies now. And this movie, I think, was trying to riff on that. Don't get me wrong, something being intentional doesn't mean it's good, but for me, I was able to ride that wave, and eventually it became fairly clear what was going on. And I do think what ends up being presented is a solid conclusion to the series. I also enjoyed the moments which I can only describe as like, oh shit, End of Ava came out last year, we gotta mimic its visual language. Language. Always love seeing that in like late 90s, early 2000s anime movies. I do understand though that if you really dug the series, this movie wouldn't be very pleasing. If you liked Akito, you're not going to appreciate that this movie mostly removes him from the cast until the very end and turns him into this kind of scarred, char type masked man. You probably also won't appreciate that the style of comedy is like a lot drier now, it's less manic. For me, if I have a criticism of this movie, I did find it a little harder to parse thematically than the show. Like, in the original series, it's pretty clear what they're trying to say with the themes. The villains are eventually revealed to be a society that has modeled themselves of 1970s robot anime. They've warped the style and aesthetics of hot-blooded bravery to create a right-wing military state. So you know, that's pretty standard genre revisionism, examining the ways in which genres can reinforce certain cultural grand narratives. And it's really well handled, one of the more interesting parts of the series. I mean, the original Tedesco is basically a sci-fi story asking what would a society that orientates its entire culture and economy around fandom be like? The answer is like, pretty, pretty bad. This movie has a similar interplay with anime and manga culture, though in a much stranger and more convoluted way. The villains of this narrative are this reactionary terror group, remnants of the original faction, who use a technology that is powered by, well, without spoiling too much, it's powered by a girl who has been frozen in time. And part of this process, part of this technology, involves feeding her brain content from shoujo manga, which sort of keeps her dreaming and that keeps technology running. <laughs> Which is like, it's cool, it's cool imagery for sure, it's kind of a cool concept, but what is this saying? Does it actually mean anything? The use of shoujo here as a kind of placating dream factory is definitely calling out to be read in a way similar to how classic mecha anime is used in the original. But in this case, what does it add up to? They make a lot out of how this technology, which is basically going to allow instant teleportation around the solar system, is about to change communication and culture on a mass level that no one's prepared for. So it sort of feels like a metaphor for the rising place of the internet in the late 90s. In this way, you could read the terrorist group's use of shoujo-powered tech as like a resurgent right wing weaponizing escapist media for their own reactionary agenda. Which, actually now that I say it, feels like a really prescient point, but it also feels too vague in the film itself for that to be explored in any real way. It kind of just feels like they went, hey, in, in the show we riffed on like old mecha anime, uh, we should do something with Shoujo this time. Anyway, Ruri is really cool, and this movie gives us a whole lot more of her. And now she's the head of a battleship, so good stuff. She doesn't actually have that much character development in the movie itself. Like, it's had a lot of character development since the end of the show, but in terms of the film's narrative, she's sort of at the same place at the start that she is at the end. But, you know, that's okay. Um, also, in this movie, she's nicknamed a cybernetic fairy, which I actually think would be a pretty good name for this character archetype. Uh, I give her five bags of popcorn. Yeah, I'm giving these characters ratings. Why not? You only live once. The other show, as I mentioned, Cyber Team and Akihabara, was one I had actually never heard about before, which is sort of weird because it seems like it was fairly popular at the time. I guess the collective anime unconscious only really had a room for like Digicarrot and its memory of this sort of hyper otaku show. The like, setup is that it's a magical girl show where the magical girls have these little chibi sidekicks that can transform into sort of power armor wearing girls. Yeah, it's about as hyper otaku as you'd imagine from that premise. 
It has the late 90s Moe designs that look a little like melted potatoes, eyes big and droopy, but it also has weird occult elements and like, honestly just look at this series. Look at this weaponized jank. This barely rendered N64 ass cover art CG. The whole thing feels extremely camp and self-referential. There are these constant title cards that seem to be used to underline weird lines of dialogue. I actually burst out laughing at this one. <laughs> Which, you know, I think is what this show is going for. A kind of self-aware combination of all the major otaku fixations of the 90s. Which makes sense for a show centered on Akihabara, where a lot of this otaku culture was expressed. Wait. Wait, wh why is there a panopticon in the middle of their school? Were these bitches at Kanon reading Foucault? This is just a style of show that I don't think exists anymore, with really a feral manic energy. Take episode six, it's pretty indicative of the tone of the first half. Its premise is that the girls make some curry, which they really put their heart and souls into, but then it gets stolen by the bad guys. The bad guys also crucify the curry, which I thought was a nice touch. Anyway, the whole episode is the girls chasing after the bad guys, trying to get the curry back, and every now and then the episode cuts to the big bads, who are like having wine and discussing Copernicus. Don't worry, by the way, the girls get the curry back. Um, but afterwards a dog eats it and starts breathing fire. <laughs> I'm not even going to get into the episode where, through very convoluted circumstances, one of the girls has to pass as male and go on a date with one of the other girls. Who am I kidding? I'm totally getting into it. So, the main character here, Barry, gets a love letter, and she's really psyched. Then it turns out to be from a girl, um, and she's not really into girls, um, so she tries to lay her down easy, but she won't let up. So what Barry does is she has her friend Mitsugi pass as male and go on a date with her because she thinks that'll prove that she's not interested. And so Mitsugi wears a jumper that just says men on it, and they go on a date, and uh, at the end, this happens. This, this show is insane. Tori Tsubame, the grey character that Asma identifies, is actually an antagonist in the series. To be honest, if Asma hadn't used her as an example, I don't think I would have thought about her in these terms. I mean, I do see a slight race similarity in that she's stoic and monotone and used to be a fighter by the sinister occult Rosencrantz society, but her design feels a bit more out of place compared to these other characters. I don't know, maybe it's the long pink hair that's kind of catching me off. She's also a way more antagonistic figure than anyone else in this list. She's basically an antagonist for the first uh, half of her appearance. Anyway, her introduction to the series coincides with it attempting to do a pretty massive tonal heel turn and become a kind of post Utina, post Evangelion psychological style drama, which really did not work for me. I kind of can't imagine it working for anyone. It's such a jarring and poorly done tonal shift. Uh, if you like the weirdly dark and somber second half of the show, please write in, the, the lines are open. Still, I'm giving her five bags of popcorn because we love a girl for redemption arc and I'm not going to blame her for poor series planning. There's also a whole bunch of other examples Asuma doesn't get into. I think Miharu from Gasuraki is really interesting because unlike what Asuma says about these characters being you know, less a linear progression from Rei and more pulling from the same database, I think Miharu actually is clearly sort of directly influenced. The design and suit she wears clearly has similarities, and early on she has a similar function in the plot as this mysterious girl linked to the anime's strange occult organizations. In Mihiru's case as well, she's one of the few marketable characters in a show just filled with old men, which is probably why so much of the promotional material and the entire ending sequence is based around her. Gasraki is directed by Takahashi, the director of Dogrum, a show I talked about in my last video, and he has his fixations, right? Politics, slow burn action, realistic mecha, these sorts of things. He doesn't strike me as the kind of director who can build a moe appeal character, and Miharu definitely doesn't strike me as one who creates moe feelings. Rather, I think she's kind of directly building off Rei and responding to her on a narrative level, which makes her interaction with the archetype a little deeper. When I say that, I'm not saying she's just like Rei, she's actually a very different character, but mecha is a really intertextual genre, right? I think we all know that mecha is constantly in dialogue with the shows that came out before. 
Miharu, like Rei, is revealed to be a kind of reincarnation of a semi-mystical figure, and to have links to vast, powerful aliens who are godlike in their abilities. Both characters are also treated as tools by secret societies, Sele in Rei's case, and Symbol in Miharu's. And towards the end of the show, we get moments from Miharu's perspective that are directly riffing on episode 14 of Ava. You know, the one of those art film-esque internal monologues from Rei's perspective. As it goes on though, she's revealed to be very much her own character. She's much more assertive than Rei, much more independent. And while it's too much to go into here, her relationship with the main character ends up riffing on a lot of themes you find throughout Takashi's work of star-crossed lovers. Anyway, on a basic non-narrative level, I really like Mihru's design. It's like a much more grungy Rei Ayanami, like, like if Rei Ayanami went to a Nirvana concert. Darker color palette, clothes, moody green hair. I love this jacket she wears. Really gives me folk punk singer vibes, which, you know, is what I'm away for. Just needs some piercings to complete the look. Definitely gets five bags of popcorn and a copy of Black Hole by Charles Burns. Speaking of grunge, I know this is kind of cringe, but I really enjoy those like goth emo edits of Ava characters. And I think Ray's design and aura really lends itself to this style. It's somewhat hot take, but I think part of Ray's appeal is actually her androgyny. Androgyny is an element you find in quite a few anime and manga style characters. And you know, I think it's been pretty well established that it's a motif that allows for a greater number of people of different genders to relate to gender specific characters. See all the many conversations about this in regards to Link after the internet collectively lost its mind over his Gerudo outfit. Partially as a result of this, it's not too difficult for Ray's motifs to be carried over into Bial works. Her wifeish appearance and the emphasis on bandages is a fixation pretty commonly found in late 90s and early 2000s Bial. Give her black hair and piercings, and she doesn't look that far off from a character you'd see in a Yun Koga manga. And there are non-BL male characters who fit into this mold too, but almost always in shoujo. See Mito from Princess Tutu. He's got the hair, the stoic doll-like demeanor, the mysterious magical elements. He is, as one of my friends put it, ray-coded. And all of this, like so much of what we have in anime, can be blamed on these absolute mad lads. The Year 29 group. 29 Group is a term given to a number of shoujo mangaka who came into prominence in the 1970s, and whose work often focused on issues of identity and featured androgyne main characters with an uneasy or peripheral relationship with gender. The full reasons for this are way too complicated to outline here, though partially it was due to the influence of films like Visconti's Death in Venice, which was huge in Japan. And what was particularly huge was its star Bjorn Andresen, who became kind of an idol there. European art cinema like this had a huge impact on authors like Modo Hagio and Keiko Takamiya, with manga like Kaze de Kino Uta and Heart of Thomas being very inspired by its aesthetic. And partially these androgynous shoujo designs were popular because they allowed their readership to explore their own gender identity through images of pixie-like figures who seem to exist ambiguously between gender roles. One can see why that would be appealing at a time when gendered behavior was even more socially regulated than it is now. And also, you know, it just looks neat. The long limbs and pixie-esque hair of these characters was a pretty perfect encapsulation of the shoujo style that had been developing. For a long time, bishonen styles like this were basically the status quo in any sort of BL manga. And initially, a lot of Japanese gay comics or gay komi would mimic that style too. As a side note, eventually, partially thanks to bar artists like Gengoro Tagame, you'd see a parallel masculine style developing, which would even become somewhat absorbed into BL. But in the early 2000s, we can still see this bishonen aesthetic as the primary style, and certainly in what I'm going to talk about now, the somewhat inaccurately titled Sensitive Pornograph. This is a manga and then an OAV that is basically just wall-to-wall -wall hardcore BDSM sex, with a lot of preferred gendered looking elvish twinks. Look at this extremely mid-2000s fashion by the way, look at this scarf situation. These are not plot heavy stories, but if I was to sum up the first part of this OAV, I'd say it's basically, hey what if we put Griffith's design in a BL manga? And if I summed up the second, I'd say it's like, hey what if we put Rei Ayanami's design in a BL manga? Both are compelling questions. Slight side note, um... If Ari Aster, the director of Midsummer, um, Hereditary, and Bo is Afraid is watching this, which, which, which you know, I hope you are, um, for your next movie, I think if you just have actor Nathan Lane watch this OAV and riff on it, you will produce the greatest piece of art known to man. Oh. Oh, I'm not going to make any closet jokes, it's too easy. 
Yeah. The most famous the closet since we lost Liberace. Mm. Hey! So the Rey figure here is Aki Ayamatsu, who may not have any mysterious powers, but he's definitely got the pale skin, the blue Ayanami bob, the bandages, and yeah, he is uh, being manipulated by outside forces. There's not a lot to talk about here narratively because there's not a lot of narrative, but I think it really shows the power of this archetype that even BL offers years after Ava were riffing on it. That's sort of the maximum level of saturation it was in. Ayamatsu gets five bags of popcorn by the way. It's worth noting too that there are predecessors to Rei. Psychoanalyst Tamaki Saito points out Nanako from Nanako SOS as an early example, due to her mixture of superpowers and a mysterious aura. I've always wondered if Four from Zeta Gundam might be a precursor. She's not stoic exactly, but she's got the short blue hair, is being psychically brainwashed by an evil organization, and pilots a demonic looking robot that she occasionally loses control of. I've not seen any of Vifam, aside from its extremely banging OP, but whenever I see this character, I do the hmm face. Much to consider there. And then there's a show that often seems to be brought up in fandom as the clearest visual precursor. Show's not over, just doing my little Patreon segment. And hey, there's some more y'all. I really appreciate it. Most of these videos aren't getting monetized because I just love using copyrighted clips and I'm bad at killing my darlings, so this helps a bunch. I also did a little Q&A video on my side channel. I really enjoy doing those. Uh, I think that's low-key why I started doing YouTube. <laughs> I do plan on doing another at some point, so if anyone has questions, feel free to ask on my Twitter, which is at Pyramid Inu, and I'll probably eventually get to it. Okay, thanks folks. Key the Metal Idol came out in 94, and it's got a story that sounds wacky. It's about a robot girl who's told by her dying maker that if she makes 30,000 friends, she'll become a real girl. So she decides to become an idol, thinking this is the most efficient way to deal with this Pinocchio ass issue. But it's actually majorly downbeat and has this very conspiracy cinema vibe. We learn pretty early on that there's a bunch of creepy organizations constructing robots, and for some reason they want to capture Key. I feel like now when this show is mentioned, it's kind of as like a proto serial experiments lane. They're very different shows, but they have that same sort of sci-fi paranoia going on. It's also a show with a really aesthetic looking main character, and it's kind of been kept alive by all sorts of Tumblr gifs, with her just kind of stylishly and vacantly staring into the distance which is like 90% of the show. It's also, I think, like the most lost decade anime. You know what I mean by this. It's the 1990s and the economic bubble has burst and all those space opera science fiction shows of the 70s and 80s, they're beginning to feel really retrograde. So Japanese sci-fi becomes insular, more urban and mundane. The ennui of Key is a good example of that. It's got that sense of restlessness and ideological decay. Like it's there in the setting of the show too. There's so many images of people just going about their lives in a fairly rundown looking Tokyo, but there's also strange new religions forming and evil mad scientists with strange plans working in big high-tech towers. A lot of episodes are just mostly mundane stuff happening in Key's life, and then at the end it'll just cut to the evil conspiratorial guys doing evil conspiracy things. This whole show, it has this feeling of like, like, oh fuck, oh shit, the economy's tanked, and all those grand narratives don't seem so grand anymore, and ah, uh, maybe I don't want to explore space and become a new type. The world is really scary, maybe I just want to stay indoors. But it's also a very stylish series. It has this dramatic yet melancholy atmosphere. As much as people bring up Lane, I also see Peter Chung in it, you know, the Aeon Flux guy. It's got that anime character of heavy cheekbones look, and, and also like Aeon Flux, it's got this fixation on evil pervy weirdos. And I really like the editing of this show. Like every episode will end with the music coming in and then this really abrupt hard cut to the credits, often while Key is kind of vacantly staring into the distance. And it gives it the feeling of like a dramatic, melancholy 1980s music video. In some ways, I think Key is the closest character on this list in personality to Rei Ayanami. She's very reactive, but she's also kind of this lost puppy with really good intentions, but very little ability to affect her surroundings. Which I guess is Moe, but it just made me feel very distraught for her at all times, if I'm being honest. Actually, I kept thinking about Astro Boy when I was watching this. Because Astro Boy is also this doll-like robot who's sort of a Pinocchio figure, and he was also conceived in this moment of huge political change and turbulence. That's reflected in the original manga with its themes of 
of like robot rights and sometimes really explicitly like there's a whole chapter of Astro Boy where he accidentally ends up back in time during an Anpo riot. But unlike Key, Astro Boy is always moving, punching bad guys, getting into hijinks, shooting machine guns out of his ass. The point is, Astro Boy is a very active hero, whereas Key feels very tiny in this big bad world. When the action happens, she's often incapacitated or locked between violent warring forces. This is actually, I think, a really big component of these characters. In fact, I would add it to Asuma's list of elements he uses to define the archetype, being fought over or manipulated by shadowy forces. You can see this in basically every character in this list, in Ruri's manipulation into being a perfect computer operator, in Otori being used by the Rosencrantz Society. Almost always these characters seem to be dehumanized and turned into living dolls by strange occult organizations. And Key is probably most explicit in this in its imagery. There's lots of creepy dolls in this show. I think all of this fits into that sense of not being able to affect change on your surroundings that you find in a lot of Japanese SF from this period. Like, there's this fixation in Japanese science fiction from the 90s on occult groups and secret societies, and often they put these big plans into motion that the major cast aren't able to affect or stop in any way. Which psychologically makes sense. You go from this period of massive economic boom to almost overnight huge economic downturn, and your whole expectation for a future just changes instantly. And yet no one can really explain to you why this happened in a way that doesn't seem to invoke strange, arcane financial terminology that doesn't even make sense to you. When things like that happen, and hey, most of us now have experienced multiple recessions in our lifetimes, it can definitely create a feeling that you're disassociated from any real power. Like the world is too complex for you to be able to have any hope of altering it. And that's in these works. Though in a sense, eventually characters like Rei and Ki are able to affect change on the world, but only when they're used as a kind of fulcrum point in some strange arcane ritual. It's also in this isolation that I think these characters become so well suited to the Tumblr gifts I mentioned. I've been sort of dancing around this, but they're kind of perfect trauma bitches, articulations of a certain kind of post-bubble ennui that finds just as easy expression in our current late capitalist, neoliberal, whatever term you want to use, Malou, as it did the 1990s. When the entire world seems sinister, and you seem disassociated from any form of meaningful action, then you start to feel, hey, maybe it's time to just stare vacantly into the distance while rain patters in the windows. Anyway, Key is great. I was rooting for her, you know? She gets five bags of popcorn and a copy of Astro Boy. It's probably not super surprising that the other work I have here as a major Ray precursor also came out during a time of national recession. Dream Island Girl is a 1974 TV movie directed by Shuichiro Sasaki, an art director who's apparently fairly acclaimed in Japanese film circles, but his work is largely unknown in English. Partially this might be because so much of his stuff are in the form of television films, a usually less canonized form, though you'd never know this was a TV movie from just how visual this thing is. So why is this live action ass movie on this list? Well, as extremely underrated YouTuber Cosmic Spooks put it, this thing oozes Hideki Anno watched it energy. It's got the use of passion Bill Canon, tight handheld camera footage, and that elliptical angsty style. Also, so much imagery of trains. Lots of train tracks. The main character of Dream Island Girl, Sayako, feels like she could have been a very big influence on Anno's interest in these sorts of stoic female figures. She's got the quiet demeanor, and her character explores that sense of being distant from yourself, unsure of your own identity. So much of the movie is basically her looking very cool in this very decayed Japan. It's a simple story. Um, she was abandoned by her parents with only her grandmother's support, and the movie is about the bond she makes with this other kid, and her eventual manipulation by an older man. That sounds very dark and dire, and it sort of is, but there's also this kind of comforting melancholy to it, which is possible, I think, because of how beautiful the filmmaking is here. The dreamlike editing and intense score creates this very internal, delicate sensibility. It's really good stuff. There's a really palpable sense in this movie of a younger generation completely betrayed by the older one. The adult figures we see here are really not good people. Just very selfish, very base in their wants, very bad folks. And the young protagonists have been completely abandoned by the older generation. They're these aimless, sort of directionless hippies, but with none of the flower power optimism that movement had in the 60s. I've experienced a lot of 70s Japanese media with hippie characters, but they're usually presented as 
Well, either as like sociopathic murderous Manson gangs or as optimistic wild children who like help Godzilla fight a smog monster. This movie's characters, however, have this extremely listless melancholy to them. They're very directionless people in this world that seems haunted and decayed. Anyway, Sayako is great. She gets five bags of popcorn and a gun. A gun to shoot bad people. I've really not delved much into the 2000s here. Um, partially that's because I'm a lot less familiar with stuff from then onwards, but it's also because there's a big elephant in this room that could really be its own video. It seems like KyoAni really took the whole silver-haired stoic girl archetype and ran with it, forming it into something probably very far from Rei or any of these characters. I just don't really have the grounding though in KyoAni to talk too much on that. Kaon is one of my favorite anime of all time, like maybe my second favorite anime behind like Nadia or Evangelion, but I was really late to the party on that one, having only seen it a few years ago. And in general, I'm just very aware this is an area I need to explore more. However, there is one example here that seems too epochal not to mention, that being Yuki Nagato from The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya. She has the exact look and disposition we've been talking about, and in the 2000s she was huge, really massive. I'd actually completely missed Haruhi during my teenage years, I, I was probably too busy watching like I don't know, Space Battleship Yamato or something, but I do remember the level of hype it had as it was coming out. I firmly remember it being so big, some people were describing it as that generation's Gundam. Not in style or tone obviously, but in its level of fandom impact. Though I have weirdly a lack of a sense of whether that's been true or not. Like, has Haruhi stuck around? Do people still talk about Haruhi? One of the main reasons I never got around to watching it was because I found the viewing order situation really daunting. I knew the airing order was vastly different from the DVD one, and the fact that no one could explain that to me was enough to make me go, eh, maybe this isn't for me. But I recently watched the whole thing. I made it a weekly arrangement of a friend of mine over Discord. We went with the airing order, by the way, which I think was a good call. I really liked how it meant a lot of the reveals were parceled out over the series. Side note, if you have friends who are geographically far away from you, I would highly recommend having an anime night over Discord. There's so much I like about it. One is that it's just really good to have little weekly rituals with your friends. There's something about that structure, having a recurrent activity that you don't have to think too much about, that is just really nice. However, I have a few recommendations for a successful weekly anime night. One, try to keep to roughly the same day every week. Obviously things will come up and it will change every now and then, but it's nice to figure out the optimum day so you don't have to like plan every time. Two, figure out how much you want to talk during the episode itself. Me and my friend have it down. Generally we catch up at the start of the call, then during the episode itself, we'll kind of shit post over Messenger, maybe occasionally saying something during the OP or the midpoint. That way, you know, you can do your MST free case style bits without it being disruptive to the flow or the aesthetics of the episode. And then at the end of the night, you can do a little chat, decompress, and talk about anything particularly insane in the episodes you've seen. Of course, it helps if you have a similar sense of humor to the person you're watching with, and mileage may vary on these rules depending on how invested you are in the series. For instance, I have another weekly Discord night where me and two other friends watch bad movies, and in that we just talk over the call the entire time, but that's largely because in that context we often have no real investment in the movie itself, we're just using it as a sounding board for riffs. Before you judge us too much for that, look at the movies we've picked, it's, it's a veritable dumpster fire. And that's another thing, the nature of the content will also alter the tone of the night. Me and the anime friends started watching Haruhi after watching Loveless. The thing is, Haruhi is actually a good show, whereas Loveless is a it, it's a hellfire. So our chat logs during that often just became wailing. Anyway, it's really fun time, would recommend. I like Haruhi, but this was definitely the optimum way for me to experience it. And honestly, what a weird show. It's a very 2000s series in that you've got your constant references to Moe, your database style selection of cute girls, your highly rendered musical numbers, but it's also got the weird combination of occult elements with slice of life romance. It's a mass market anime that still has that otaku production feeling, that let's just do whatever we want mentality. Like, there's an entire episode in here in which basically nothing happens, and the whole thing is shot in like Michael Haneke style surveillance footage. I I'm fairly sure this episode is inspired by the movie Cache. Yo, why why were people surprised by Endless 8? Yuki Nagato is absolutely the best thing about this series. There's no competition, really. Mikuru sucks, I, I want none of that Mikuru nonsense, and, and Harry is pretty fun. But Yuki, Moe quiet girl who's a manifestation of an alien robotic hive mind, chef's kiss, truly best girl. 
here, I'm going to hand it over to the friend I watched Haruhi with. She had a longer relationship with the show than me, it being one of the first anime she watched. She has her own YouTube account, by the way, at Rayclone, which we actually did not plan that. Anyway. I've never really thought to list Yuki Nagato as part of my, like, canon of favourite anime characters. I don't know why. Maybe it's just that the idea of being into Haruhi has become such a relic that I have a sort of academic distance from it in my memory. But like, I loved Yuki. Whenever people ask me about my gay awakening or whatever, I usually have to say fucking Mac from Chicken Run or several things that happened in Tokyo Mew Mew. But Yuki was my first favourite female character from a show focused on multiple romance options, making her my de facto first ever quote unquote best girl. I posted fan art of her wearing a Lolita dress on DeviantArt, which is basically the 2010 weeb equivalent of a knighthood. It was really nice to rewatch Haruhi and see that, yeah, I was totally right and Yuki is the best thing about this show by a thousand miles. But there's also this weird element of realising that I like her in a completely different way than I did over a decade ago. Ray clones are moe, this is lore basically, <laughs> but watching Haruhi at age 12 Yuki's cool, emotionless personality didn't occur to me to be any sort of like facade that I should break through to reach a sweet, melting centre to protect at all costs. She was just cool and emotionless, and that's some real isekai hero level of aspirational when you're a 12 year old girl about to start high school and feeling way too much of literally every emotion possible. But simply, I didn't want to protect Yuki, I wanted to be her. This is super dark, so like, remember, feel free to just cut this out. I remember literally sitting during my grandpa's funeral, okay, and not wanting to cry because I was 12 and humiliated by my own existence. So just being like, okay, gotta channel Yuki, what would Yuki do? Like, there's a rank above S tier and it's got me through a family member's funeral tier. I probably wouldn't have had this same reaction to, for instance, Rei if I'd watched Evangelion at that age. Yuki is a version of Rei, right, without a lot of the downsides. Her awkwardness is accepted by a close group of friends and her wounds are painless. So it's not that I think my experience speaks to some grand reinterpretation of the Rei clone archetype or anything. I guess what I'm trying to say is that because characterization in anime can be so trope heavy and databasey, it's easy to apply that rigidity to something as inherently subjective as the audience's response to a character. When I first watched Haruhi, I was very much not the target demographic. Pretty much every reference flew over my head, I had to reverse engineer from dialogue what moe even meant, and while I did have a best girl, the only merch I could afford over the course of my Haruhi era was this one £20 poster I ordered through my dad's Amazon account. I had, in short, not yet come into the full fruit of my weebhood, and was thus unconnected from the database. Yuki was not an archetype to me, she was just herself, and I loved her. In Asma's discussion of Ray-like characters, he's primarily interested in their moe elements. You could say that the original Ray is kind of an odd character to be described as moe. She has no desire to be protected, and she lives a solitary, somewhat bare existence in her brutalist flat when not piloting a demonic robot. And yet people do find her moe, and hey, I find her cool. I mean, I love those casual wear Ray statues you get. I guess what I find visually satisfying in Ray is that appearance that is at once wounded and weakened while remaining powerful and self-reliant. There's something to that imagery of the frail, willowy anime girl framed in bandages, but appearing unfazed in the midst of a sinister world. It's neat, you know? It's a visual archetype that seems to simultaneously acknowledge a certain level of hurt and fear, while maintaining a wish-fulfillment repose. When I first got into anime at 13 or 14, I was pretty obsessed with Rei and other characters who followed that motif. I don't think it's hard to see why that fragility, entwined with a powerful, delicate stoicism, could feel empowering. But also, you know, sometimes a thing just looks neat. So is this your record collection? God, no, this is just junk I have for sale. The record room is off limits. Really? Are all these 
Chinese records? Yeah, it's got about uh, 1,678 at this point. I try to pare down the...